My name is André. I'm Dutch. Um, already told this in the session this morning, but, but if you have any questions about the Netherlands, I have never been in a coffee shop. I cannot help you. I, <laughs> I don't know. I don't smoke. So uh, the only thing I do know is we have a smoking ban in public places, which is awkward if you have a coffee shop to run. Uh, so we changed the law a little bit. You can now smoke cannabis in a coffee shop. Not normal cigarettes. That would be illegal. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Um, so enough about myself. If you need to get in touch with me, <clears throat> tweet me or email me or do the uh, gmail.com also works. Um, I am really horrible at uh, responding uh, after one email. You need to email me like five times or something. Don't worry. I'll see it at some point. Um, same with the uh, tweet. Uh, just if you need the code or that link that I sent uh, or talked about, just tweet me five times or something. Keep reminding me. Uh, I'm, this is a bad thing of me. I'm not very good at following up right away. Just keep keep trying it. I'm a, I work for a company called CloudDBA with this guy over here. Uh, has a name called William. <laughs> this, this guy. <laughs> Uh, and that's enough marketing for today. I worked with SQL Server. This is an important part of this thing, introduction. I am a SQL Server guy. I am, th this conference I've noticed there's two kinds of people, uh, presenters, two kinds of presenters. The PowerShell gurus, the, the, even the guys that make PowerShell are here. <laughs> Again. <laughs> 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 oh. Don't worry, this is my second session with Jeffrey Snover in the room. I'm not <laughs> oh. So, I t my girlfriend already found this out years ago, but if you come up to me and you go, why is your face all red? It just goes boom. So that <laughs> you can have me look embarrassed. Easy, easy. Just go, why are you so red? Um, now, uh, there will be a, a bunch of PowerShell code here that I've written. It's ugly, um, but I still want to go through that stuff with you because I wrote it to fix a problem, not because I wanted to write really nice PowerShell code. Um, I've learned some things since. This, is, this code is half a year old, and um, I'm, I'm using something called Pester. I, who, knew, who knows what Pester is here? Most of you, I can skip a whole bunch. Oh, my session will only be half an hour. Good. Um, now, I, I, I did this talk in, at, at the user group, the PowerShell user group in Holland. Um, I thought, oh, I'll show my pester stuff that I just wrote. And before me and after me, the session, there were five sessions that day, but the session right before and right after uh, was from a major contributor to the pester framework. And the title of one of the sessions, I'm not sure whether it was before or after, was what not to do in a pester test. <laughs> <laughs> he was sitting in the front row, shaking his head, looking at my code. I could see him developing a headache while I... <laughs> <laughs> he gave me some good tips and also told me why what I did could get me in trouble. So I'll, 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 I'll share the code with you and I'll also tell you why I could get in trouble with doing the things that I do. So um, maybe you can learn something from that, right? Let's see. Um, first things first, if, you're, if you have SQL servers, I always need to say this wherever I am, go to dbatools.io, download that stuff. It is the best PowerShell library for SQL server. Um, we use it everywhere. I work for, oh, here we go again, and this is being recorded. <laughs> I am not allowed to tell you who I work for. I, I have my company with him, but I'm um, uh, hired out to a Dutch government agency. And funny enough, they allow me to give a, a, an explanation. I am not allowed to say who it is. So here we go, explanation. If you make money, these guys want half of it. <laughs> <laughs> You figure it out. <laughs> so we have hundreds and hundreds of SQL servers, big, big SQL servers, and a really formal process for the disaster recovery because um, the department I work for is actually the department that does not collect money, it gives money out. So uh, rent support, child support, that kind of stuff. 
1.2 billion euros per month goes out to people. Um, if we're a couple of days late, if, we, if our bank file arrives at the bank on Friday too late, they can't process it, they need to do it on Monday, we end up in the newspaper. Uh, the minister gets questions. Why was this late? People got in trouble, right? Um, if you're below the, uh, the income level that's, that's needed for, uh, um, to, get, to have a decent life, and you need rent support and child support and all these things, and we're late, we give you a, a, have it a week later, that's not cool. So we have a lot of processes around stuff. Uh, one of them is a disaster recovery document, completely fully tested on, we have, I think, 150 SQL servers, all 72 core machines with half a terabyte of memory, pretty serious stuff. Um, our disaster recover, uh, recovery document has the DBA tools in it. It, is, it has been tested fully by our test team who does nothing else but test this on their uh, test farm. And uh, it, it's been approved by my colleagues that disaster recovery document has DBA, uses DBA tools. This is how important PowerShell and PowerShell libraries from the community are these days, right? Big corporations depend on them happily. They're totally cool with that. Now, um, why is this here? This is from a deck that I've used for SQL Server stuff. Um, ah, yes, Brent. If you're a SQL guy, you want to check your SQL servers if, if you have them configured correctly, especially if you come into a new place. Um, we've had one occasion that was yeah, in November last year or something. William goes into a customer site, runs something similar to this, figures out last backups were January 27. This was November. So, no, January of the year before. Does it even matter? <laughs> <laughs> so, what do you do as a consultant uh, hired to fix their performance problems? You see, there have been no backups since forever. You take your hands off the keyboard right away, right? Dear customer, come here, sit down. We're going to make backups right now. Yeah, but that's not what we hired you for. Uh, sorry, but we're walking if you're not making a backup. Um, there's no way we're touching a system if the backups are not working. No way. So important. Um, so what do you do? You come into a place. You do this at your work as well. It doesn't have to be a new place. You run something, a script that will tell you if things are OK, right? SQL guys use this, SP Blitz. This is from a guy called Brent Ozar. Uh, SQL guy, SQL community guy, and it just does a sanity check on your servers. It's just a, it's just a big one single store procedure that you run on your system and out comes a list. Hey, you're not running backups. Hey, your CheckDB doesn't work. Hey, your log file is way bigger than your database file. Maybe something went wrong. Um, oh, and they keep added, adding stuff to it. It's well maintained by the community. It's open source. It's on GitHub um, and it's used by a lot of people. So. SQL version of a nice PowerShell library, right? It's really good. Oh yeah, and this is also important for later, <laughs> and also because I can't uh, stop talking about this guy, um, because my pester tests are about testing if the backups work, and this guy makes backup scripts. This is uh, a guy called Ola Hallengren. He makes the best backup scripts that there are in the world for SQL Server. Uh, do not use maintenance plans, do not use um, VSS snapshot based systems. If you have those, lots of companies have those. Um, can I stop this thing for a minute and do a sidetrack here? One, one minute, I'll steal your time. This is not about PowerShell, but I think it's important. If you have SQL servers and you have a VSS snapshot based system, watch your error log. Um, what I've seen four times last year, four times, I think four different locations. Um, you have a busy SQL servers, and mind you, SQL servers are busy at night, rebuilding indexes, checking the database, running w data warehouse collection processes. They can be real; they can even be more busy than during the day. So during the night, you start your VSS snapshot backup with VM. Um, what else is there? All of them. Yeah, your favorite third-party tool, DPM. They all do the same mechanism. It doesn't matter. It's it's not the supplier's fault, right? So 
you start your VSS backup, you can see this in the SQL Server error log. It, it will say uh, I.O. frozen for just a few seconds, maybe one second, maybe two. So the I.O. freezes so the, uh, the backup mechanism can take a snapshot of the disks so your transactions are consistent because it needs the data and the log file. They could be on different systems, different disks, and they need to be consistent. So this is where the driver comes in. It freezes the I.O. and then the backup software can take that stuff. Now, there's a buffer somewhere because the I.O. doesn't stay frozen until this backup is done. That could take hours, right? And in the meantime, your stuff needs to continue working. So there is a, a caching mechanism somewhere on disk and in memories. Lots of stuff is happening to make sure that it appears that everything is frozen for the duration of the backup, but it's not. You can continue doing I.O.s. At some point, when you have a really busy SQL Server, this system might overload. And if you're lucky, it will just crash your backup. But I've already seen it four times last year. Uh, what you need to watch out for in your event log when you get back to work on Monday, uh, Volsnap error 25. If you see that, pretend you didn't. Get some coffee and mention to a colleague that well, maybe we should ch check backups. This guy mentioned that we should. Uh, Volsnap error 25 means that Windows tells you I cannot keep up, something went wrong, I have discarded the cache, and I'm just using what was on disk. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one second later, SQL Server will say, read from disk. That's not mine. Uh, stale read error in your error log, and right after that, uh, a crash, blue screen, stack dump, done. Database broken. You need to go back to your previous backup if you have one. Painful, very painful. So uh, am I telling you not to use any third-party backups anymore that use VSS snapshot-based system? No, 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 no. <laughs> it's not that bad, but be careful. Be careful. If you, if you have it set up too tight and you are overloading that system while it's running, look at the errors in your error log. Volsnap errors, be careful with them. Uh, and there is nothing worse than a corrupt database. Right? Because that means you've lost data. Who here has a boss that says, we can lose about a day of data? <laughs> that was the old thing, right? Oh, a day is about a thing. Once a night backup. Yeah, until it happens. <laughs> um, you guys know about RPO, RTO? Recovery point objective, recovery time objective. How much data can you lose when it, when it breaks? And how much time uh, can it take until you're back online? These things together. Right? You have to think about this stuff. 30 more seconds and I'll continue to the PowerShell stuff. I have a company uh, that we work for. It's a slaughterhouse, uh, literally. Um, uh, Snitzels come out the back of the thing and trucks with live animals in the front. Um, big... Th no, it's a... <laughs> if you do not pay your bills in Holland, oh, <laughs> turn you into Snitzels. No, no. Um, so these guys have thought about their, because it went wrong one day, the SQL Server crashed, and these guys have thought about their RTO, RPO. Um, their um, recovery time objective, so how long can we be down? If the SQL Server goes down, no more meat get, gets processed in the entire factory, because in the supermarket, if they find meat that's not okay, they need to scan the barcode and trace it all the way back to the farm. Even the family of the cow it came from, they need to know these things. So, no more processing gets done. Um, trucks fill up the docks, parking lot, the, the road to the gate, across the corner, and then across the, along the road. Now, the building is a bit long, and there's a thing that sticks out. That's the office of the boss, of the, the owner of the company. After one hour, he can see trucks, and he starts calling. What is going on? So, their recovery time objective is one hour because the boss will be starting asking questions if he sees trucks after an hour. <laughs> this, is, this is them being serious. <laughs> I thought it, okay, at least you've thought about it. Um, recovery point objective, much more serious though. Five minutes, they can all go in if they lose five minutes of data. That's about if you make transaction log backups every five minutes, something like that, and it fails, you lose five minutes of data. They go into the factory Everybody that's allowed to be in the factory, everybody scrubs, get into some protective gear, wash their hands, go in, 
and look at lists and buckets and things and scans and that takes them the half the day, but after half a day they have all the information back and they can continue processing without losing anything. That's about five minutes. What they lost was 15 minutes. They tried it for hours and then gave up. Nothing they could do that it was impossible to find back and they had to clean out the entire factory. All the meat, all the animals, except for the ones that were still alive, they could just move them back to the truck, of course, but everything needed to be cleaned out and thrown away. This is not just a huge cost for this company, it's also a huge waste of a lot of animals that died for nothing, right? Uh, at least that. So, think about this stuff. Back to PowerShell. Uh, uh, hola, yeah, it's super simple, there's a few slides. Just download maintenance.sql, run it on your server, you get a bunch of jobs without schedule, nothing starts running, and you just schedule the ones that you need. Really cool stuff. Um, oh yeah, and there's two things you change. Where the backup needs to go and do you want to clean them up? Because don't write your backups to the C drive. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, people do that, yes, and then the C drive fills up. Right? Okay, but these are the jobs. Next, okay. Uh, you guys already all know Pester, so I don't have to show you, but um, uh, this is a Star Trek reference. Let's see how, how geeky you are. Um, I'm going to do a GN, yes, GNDN demo. Anyone want to guess what that means? Oh, are you guys not geeky enough? Or is, it, is this the old Star Trek that you've not, never seen? <laughs> So I won't even have to show the demo because most of you have seen Pester already. So I'm just gonna do, I'll show you this really simple power, uh, Pester test. Um, I love Pester because it's a really simple way to see if something is okay or not. Green is good, red is bad, love that. If you've ever seen a configuration of a SCOM system or something, there's so many things that it can be okay but not. And, timeouts and uh, this is simple green is good red is bad so what does this test do can anyone spot what it does <laughs> seriously oh it does <laughs> fine <laughs> typo that's not what I meant <laughs> here skip Two piece. English not a first language for me. <laughs> no, I should know how to write skip. <laughs> uh, no, the test itself, what does it do? The t there's three tests here. True, should be true, and they all say the same thing. So what does it test? Nothing. <laughs> so, it, st Star Trek history. Look it up on Wikipedia if you don't believe me, but you see this a lot where an engineer takes a tricorder and looks at these um, tubes in the hallways and it says GNDN and then a number. So what do you think GNDN means? Exactly. <laughs> Goes nowhere, does nothing. <laughs> And that's basically how you write your first pester test, right? They sh you should fail in the beginning, so it goes nowhere, does nothing, doesn't really apply. But basically, you set up your structure, and then you put your tests in. But you, my, at least mine, my very first one, goes nowhere and does nothing. It's for me to figure out what, 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 how would I set this up. So, <coughs> since you've seen pester already, this is um, my friend Rob. Not in the room. Okay, good. I can talk about it. Um, in, in, in the old days, like six months ago, um, I used to not use Pester or anything for no PowerShell to test my SQL Server because testing SQL Server, that's what F5 is for on Management Studio, right? Put your script in Management Studio, hit F5, stare at it for a bit, get a cup of coffee, Try to fix, and if you're done, you're done. You save it to a SQL file, no more testing. Uh, until you hit a different situation on a different server, etc., etc. 
at some point you're going to have to test this more often or in different scenarios or when it's in production test if it's still okay maybe check your landscape and and this is what um, rob introduced me to normally you would use pesto for something like this uh, i have my browser open yeah i do so um no Oh, control one. No, zoom it. Doesn't matter. For now, this this is a pest test. No need to read what it what it says. But um, I'll, I'll load up zoom it later so you can uh, actually uh, read what you what, uh, what need what you need to read. I have written a, a bunch of SQL that used is used to audit a SQL server. It switches on auditing, but it's. Um, there's a lot of moving parts. You need to have enterprise edition. You need to have uh, certain rights. Need to go down from a policy uh, from the uh, uh, the domain controller, and you need to have certain uh, security policy rights set on the machine itself. Uh, you need to have an audit specification, and this is SQL Server. I won't bore you too much with it. You need to have a, an audit specification that tells you, do I audit to a log file or the the error log? Uh, sorry, the um, event log, the security event log. Um, can there be a delay? What do I do if I cannot audit it? Do I stop the SQL server? Uh, do I cancel the command that somebody gave? Or do I just think it's okay? Then your audit is not waterproof. Auditors might not like that. Um, and then there is an, a server audit specification that will say, hey, if somebody changes the audit, log that as well. And that is database audit specifications. If somebody runs a SQL query, Save that somewhere. Might not want to do that on a busy system. Um, anyhow, so f quite a complicated script, and I needed to run it every Sunday on the whole landscape because if somebody adds a database, it doesn't magically appear in the audit specifications. So I need to run this every Sunday to switch that on. Uh, there is a trick. You can add an audit specification to the model database. So if you do new database, it will have it. But that won't work if somebody restores the database. I like to leave the model database alone. Uh, so every Sunday something runs. And I need to test this myself if the script is okay, but also on the whole landscape. This is one of, just one of the things that I need to test. So I'm, I'm using AppVayor. I figured out it has SQL Server installed. So I can just, um, AppVayor is a good, who knows AppVayor? A handful of people. Okay, it's a continuous integration system uh, where in the cloud, it lives in the cloud. So in your GitHub repository, it can be a, um, a private one, you just have a little file, an appveyor.yaml file with a little bit of configuration that tells AppVayor how to test this thing. So every time I take my SQL file and I put it in GitHub, seriously, I've been a DBA for 20 years, I would never imagine myself standing in front of a room of people and saying GitHub. <laughs> <laughs> That, it's a brave new world, even for old school DBAs like me. Put your code in, in GitHub and I automatically, because I saved something and I changed something in GitHub, AppVayor comes along, grabs my code and my test, um, my uh, pester tests, loads the code into the SQL database that's on there. I can even specify, does it need to be a 2016 or a 14 or whatever? And it tests the thing automatically. So I can tweak a little thing, hit save, or it's not called save, I know. Um, uh, change, change my GitHub, uh, and it will automatically be tested. No more loading it into something, press F5, stare at stuff. If it breaks, it will tell me. And this one actually breaks, you can't read it, but it says, is the server audit enabled? And it breaks because on a, um, uh, an AppVayor server, you can't enable it. Um, there's a sp specific thing that you need to do uh, and I haven't figured out how to do that automatically yet. You can, and the, the idea is that you don't go in manually and, and change a build server because there aren't any. They make a new one for you for every test. Every build server is a brand new build server. It's completely clean. And then they throw it away after an hour. So I've even figured out that you can skip this test when you're in AppVayor because they set a, vi uh, a variable. Really cool. Yeah. Uh, you don't see that in this test yet, but... Anyhow, this is, this is me playing around with uh, Pester a little bit before. And then Rob comes along. And 
He goes, have you ever heard of operations validation for a framework? I go, no, never heard of it. He goes, that is, it's basically an idea. And somebody actually wrote a framework that's called that way. But it's, in, for all intents and purposes, it's an idea. And what you do is you do not use Pester to test your code, because that's what the original intention of the thing is. You have a Pester test that tests your PowerShell file that has the same name without the tests um, in the name. So you test your code, right? No, with this thing, you take Pester and you go out into your landscape and you test everything in your landscape. And they, they call it operations validation. I thought, oh, this sounds pretty cool. And Rob wrote, um, and that's why I showed the Ola Hallengren code before. Rob wrote a um, Pester uh, test to test if your backups are configured correctly. If the full is running, if your logs are running, if the agent is switched on, if the backup directory is there, uh, you can co you can go on and on, right? Uh, if there is there a file that's no more no older than this, is the cleanup working? Uh, and not just for one server, for everything, right? Just point it to a list of your servers and loop through. I thought, okay, this is cool. Um, I have hundreds of them. Um, I'm going to use this. And I started playing around with it, and uh, I, I think I went a little bit overboard with it. Um, because I went through it with the scum mindset that I had, where you can do anything and everything, right? Uh, exceptions, and maybe uh, Pester is really simple, green, good, red, bad. Uh, but there's different levels in, in most mon monitoring tools, like uh, alerts and warnings and this might be wrong, right, kind of things. Or this would be wrong if it was production, but it's not. Uh, but you may want to look at it before it goes to production, all these variations on a theme. Um, a guy to learn, oh yeah, I, I, had a, I have to mention him. Um, do I have a name? Erwin Strachel. Is he Dutch? Yes, I, his name doesn't sound Dutch at all. <laughs> Uh, so um, I've learned a lot by looking at his code. He writes um, pester tests to check, check his landscape, so OVF tests, basically. Uh, and in his case, a lot for Active Directory. I'm not an Active Directory guy, but I me immediately saw what he was doing. Uh, here's one where um, he just checks uh, if the AD forest configuration is okay and if there's a, a he has and he has a bunch on his blog. So if you want to do your own checking of your own Active Directory at, uh, at work, uh, you may want to take a look at what he does. Now, so far sounds simple, right? Uh, you want to see my ugly goat? Yeah, they go like, yeah. <laughs> I really literally mean ugly goat. <laughs> no, this is... Uh, so, as a SQL guy, I have a problem with... You know, I say SQL guy and I start management studio. Stop doing that. Um, what I try to do is um, this. I've made something work on this. Make it a little bit smaller. Yeah. This is my basis for my test because I went, okay, uh, I'm not going to write a test for every database in my landscape because there's thousands of them. And there's, there's completely dynamic, well, not completely dynamic, that would be a problem, but they're reasonably dynamic. Every week I might we have, they do a release and I might have 10 more and, or 20 less, or um, I'm not going to change my, my pester test accordingly. And what if you do uh, tests for indexes or something, right? There, that, especially with SQL Server, there's so many levels, like inst server, instance, database, index, um, naming conventions, the agent, the jobs, there's just so many things going on. Um, I need some form of abstraction on top of this and some way to do iteration really quickly and create tests quickly. So I, I went with this. I'll show you and let me know if you, you like it. I, I've got some other ideas in there. This is also the point, at, well, not this point, but when I showed the code that runs on this, where the guy that wrote that, uh, not he didn't write it, but he was a major contributor, went, oh, man, 
head hurts. Uh, so let's see. But what I'm doing here, this is basically a Rob's test. I took Rob's test that does the Ola Hallengren checking, and I made it into a configuration because most of my servers will need the same test, but not all of them. Some have slight variations. And I need to have a central place to manage these variations. I need to have somewhere where I can just say, okay, most of my servers need to look like this. And um, I need to have exceptions also a lot. Uh, there, is, there are trace flags that, I, that, that you start up SQL Server with that help you make SQL Server go faster that uh, don't work anymore in newer versions of SQL Server. So I need to check a trace flag, but not on those versions. Right? If it is SQL Server 2016, skip that. Um, don't do that. Uh, maybe another form of trace flags is needed. or um, You have all these monitoring tools that go... Your I.O. should be within three milliseconds. Well, not on my data warehouses. That can be higher. That there's, there's all kinds of stuff that, uh, that I need to put somewhere. So I have um, an XML file. Uh, yeah, sorry. I know everybody moved over to JSON and YAML and whatnot. I work for the government. I thought XML was already, it worked. They, they said, OK, XML, yeah, we know this. Uh, and um, I, I, I literally, seriously, I work in a, an office here, and across the room from the coffee machine is the mainframe guys. Um, <laughs> if I hear the discussions at the coffee machine sometimes, uh, they have pretty cool servers. Buy them once, plug them in, never switch them off. They don't reboot them. Um, it's an interesting uh, uh, place to work at. They... Um, they, did, um, they wanted to get rid of a bunch of people that uh, are um, on aged technology. They, they need to go away. And they wanted to hire new people, so they put out this uh, thing where you can get a bag of money if you leave now. And they made that a bit too wide. We made a newspaper again. They made it a bit too wide. So there were literally uh, people two months before retirement that were in that category. <laughs> They read this and they almost choked on that coffee. They went, what? <laughs> I can get a bag of money and leave now and not in April? <laughs> um, and, and of course, all the people that had, uh, and they were in the mid-30s and had recent technology knowledge went away as well. And now they're hiring uh, new people with n n new skills. And it's really cool to look at that in the, in the hallways where you see the old school people and the young guys. And for some reason... They look exactly the same. Long beards. Uh, the, I can tell who's the old school by the sandals. They have sandals. <laughs> and the, but the, this, this thing takes me two weeks. Uh, this, this is not a beard. Uh, I should talk about this. I should return this. That thing is good. So. I have a configuration here. You see the context. You can almost recognize what I'm trying to do here with the pester, right? There's a context which also exists in the pester, and the configuration configuration would be the describe section. So you got to describe Hallengren, and then a context, backup related jobs, maintenance jobs, cleanup jobs, etc. This is what I'm trying to do: make a configuration, and then run this configuration on a list of servers. So I have another XML. Won't bore you with that, but it has a list of servers and the configuration that it should apply to. So if a SQL server has, if a server has SQL server, it should have a backup. That's how we're testing this stuff. And also, I have some uh, looping going on here. For instance, here, uh, I have a context name, database related best practices. And you can see here a database and a for each inside my XML. And it has uh, regex, because why would you write a completely new and uh, shiny thing without using regex? Right? That's not cool at all. It needs everything needs some regex. <laughs> <laughs> There's a regex session later. I'm gonna uh, go there and make my brain hurt just for the fun of it. I won't be able to understand half of it, but I'm gonna go anyway. So code. There's um, three pieces. Let me go here. Oh, no, here. Oh, no, let me first start this. Um, 
go zoom. Let me zoom in a bit. Here we go. Ah. So looks a little bit like um, uh, an, a normal directory of the pesta test. Normally you would have the SQL server dot ps1 would be your PowerShell code that you wrote. Then the SQL server dot tests dot ps1 would contain the pesta test to test that SQL server dot ps1 to see if your code is okay. And then there's a helper. Never mind the HPT. That's the department I work for. It's a funny Dutch name. I'm not even going to repeat that here. I, l I wanted to take that off. I thought, no, let's not change the code right before a demonstration. So, And then there's my servers.xml and my configuration.xml that I just showed you. Now, the, the setup is similar. My SQL server.tests.ps1 is still the file that you execute. It has the code that it starts the pester stuff. So you can execute that, or you can even do invoke pester and point to that file, and you will get pester tests. And the SQL server.ps1 has all the code that knows how to get to SQL server and what to, what to get. Uh, it has the SQL server knowledge. The tests file doesn't. It just calls functions in the SQL server thing. So you could also create a, an exchange one, an Active Directory one, if I had any clue how to do that and what to do with it. But I don't. I'm a SQL server guy. Now, and the helper is the interesting bit that helps me tie this stuff together. Now, normally in the SQL server.tests.ps1, you would expect a pester test. In my case, unfortunately not. Um, it's not there. So what I'm doing there, here we go. There's a bunch of code. And the only one that's in here is the it function. So I should actually go to the helper because I've split it up in a, in a, in a bit of a strange way. Because the describe and the context are the same for whatever pesta tests you're going to do. They, they are just um, making sections, right? It's a, it's a, I want it to look this way, right? I want to have a section like this and then a section this, so I can, if I view it on a screen, it looks logical to me. So those are in a separate file. It just reads it from the XML file and creates a describe and creates um, 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 the other one section thingy. Region, no, not other region. Context. context, thank you. Thank you. In the middle of a talk about Pester, doesn't know context. Uh, so it will create the, the, the describe and the context, and it will leave the it part up to this script, because it part is where the actual test has to come from. So it, it, the helper function let me load that up. It's maybe easier to see. Helper here. Yeah. There's a little function in the top that does nothing else than uh, test if an HTML ex uh, element exists. So if I find, if I want to test if something is in the XML, if it's if it is an actual existing element, that I need to test that because it gives an error if it doesn't exist. So I'm doing this in a try catch block. Um, but this is where the actual configuration gets read. Oh, that's maybe too much. So the first part just loads the script, and then here is where I go through the XML file. It's basic XML file part processing, where you can see me go through um, servers, dot server, <laughs> servers, servers, server, role, role. That this is usually what XML handling looks like, right? Lots of repeating sections with plural and then singular and then something else in plural, etc., etc. It can be really long. Uh, that's your typical XML processing. Um, and then I'm going through. And then as you can uh, see here, the context starts there. So I'm making collections. I'm taking a, a collection that is the, the scribe. And inside there, I, I create other collections that are the context. And inside the context, I put collections that are the it. And the it contains text uh, it can, uh, and, and uh, contains even code. So I'm looping through. What I also do is here, 
got about 15 minutes left. Right? I, and I'm, I'm not trying to explain this t to death so you all understand exactly how that works. It's just the, the method that I'm using. But what I'm basically doing is I'm building uh, a collection and I'm putting all the things that I want to test in there uh, based on the structure that I've come up with. And I'm also parsing the XML file with my servers in it. So I end up with a list of tests that I want to do on a list of servers. And that I feed to the, um, to the other script. So my uh, script even contains the PowerShell code uh, inside the collection. The, the test code is in there. All I, all I do uh, in, the, uh, in the other file is invoke it. I, uh, I even list, and you can see that back here, it's easiest to see in the XML. This is also where somebody said to me, uh, the pester guy, if it's really hard to wrap your own head around it and to explain it, you may want to revisit your code. I know, I know. <laughs> I've heard this. <laughs> this is also a part of why I'm still talking about this and telling you. But um, what I'm, for instance, what I'm doing is here is the database thing. and. Here's, uh, uh, for instance, the recovery model should be full of every database. The page verify should be set to checksum. This is a SQL Server thing. And there's a few other things. All it does is if the test is named database, it will assume the SQL Server file will have the function, the file, PowerShell file, will have a function named get database. That's it. And it will also assume that these columns come back from the query that it runs on the database. So all I need to do is put in there, uh, in here, um, in, in, the, um, in the SQL Server file, I'll put a function in there, get index, and get a bunch of columns back of things that I want to check. And the function should have um, the, the level that I want to go to, so if it's database, I should insert a database and a, an instance name because I still need to know which one, right? If it would be a table, I need to put the table name, the database name, and the instance name. I need It needs to know which level, where are you? But which index? Um, as long as that function is there and it gets the right parameters, I don't have to specify to call it anywhere. It will just infer the name from this XML file. So put the function in the SQL Server file I put the piece of XML here in the config file, and it will figure it out automatically. So once you've written this code, all I need to do as a DBA is write really simple functions in my SQL Server PS1, get this, get that, get whatever, and put that in an XML, and my tests go out. Um, prove to you that it actually works. Uh, SQL Server tests. There's not a single PESTA test in this thing. It's all dynamically created. I go through the XML, I infer the name, I run it against the SQL Server thing, and I spit out PESTA tests. But there, in the file itself, there are no PESTA tests, none at all. But it allows me to, do, to run hundreds or thousands of PESTA tests. Now, uh, as you can see, this is my laptop, and I've tested it twice. I did one with local host and one with the name of the laptop, so that's a bit of a fake test, but just to show you that you can have, uh, in production, I can have tens of thousands of tests running. Um, I, I'm running into two problems here. And the first problem I've noticed a while ago with this code, and the guy that was a major contributor to the Pastor uh, organization also told me, um, you need to, in a pester test, you need to make really sure that uh, you hit all your tests. So if you put a lot of logic in your pester test and something goes wrong inside your pester logic, which means you're skipping a test, you might not see it, right? You might think you test something, but something went wrong in your pester test and you're not testing it. And then we're back to the problem that I had in the first place. This is why I started using this thing, right? 
Um, no, yeah, yes. Now I have to actually write pass the test to test this code. Absolutely true. Um, I also got the advice, he said, you seem to be concatenating a lot of strings together to make this work. And it, that's an easy way to make things fail, right? This is hard to maintain. At some point, I'm going to program myself in problems, right? I'm going to not know how to... I'm going to... This is a problem I've seen with many, many, many frameworks that, need, that want to be um, generic. They're never generic enough. <laughs> You write something that's completely generic and you go to work on Monday morning and you, get, and you think, nah, I've got this one exception here that doesn't fit in it. Now I have to go back and made, make it even more generic to make sure this case works. So is this the best way to go about these things? Uh, oh, let's do a show of hands. <laughs> I've got an opinion on this already. Who thinks this was a cool way to do pester? Nobody. <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> okay, some people thought, that, yeah, the, your attempt was really cool, but you shouldn't do it this way. All right? This is the, the thing. This is what I, what I feel about it. It is, it, it is my start with making it as generic as possible so I can test a lot, a lot, uh, along a lot of tests. Just create them, auto, uh, create them automatically from some code. But in the long run, this is not maintainable. You agree, right? Yeah. Yeah. So... I'm going to 10 minutes. No, the next speaker will have a problem here. <laughs> Sorry, what was that? That is, when I mentioned I have two problems, that's the second one I want to talk to you about. <laughs> so, uh, here's my audit test. My audit test actually uh, did things much simpler. I have a few functions, but I have actual tests in them. So I write a PESTA test that is recognizable, that has fe features in it, is completely self-contained, and it just has a loop on the top for each server in servers, and I feed it. Where I get the servers doesn't matter. Some of you will have them in a list, some in, some in an AD group, doesn't matter. But I wrote a self-containing simple PESTA test that has actual PESTA tests, and I check, uh, I check my configuration this way. This means I have to write more PESTA tests, right? The XML thing, I didn't have to write anything. It was easier, it was simpler, but it's never generic enough. And at some point I'm gonna get in trouble because I'm gonna run into problems and I'll be spending more time on my framework than on the actual work, which was the whole goal in the first place was to get rid of that, right? So simply write your PESTA tests, um, put all the logic in there. You might, if, it, if it's a lot, split it out in two files, but uh, then the generic stuff, be careful with that. You're going to program yourself in uh, into trouble. One other thing that I'm considering doing is, and this is not done by a long shot. This is just a, do I have that here? This is pseudocode. It's not real code. But uh, I want to test my landscape in two ways, not one way. If I have literally thousands and thousands and thousands of things that I want to test, these things run at night, right? I, I've already seen somebody that used um, uh, a CI server to run it for him um, to test things automatically. But you can schedule this in a batch. Doesn't matter how you do it, but it runs at night. It saves everything to this end unit XML output and then parses through it. If it finds problems, it can even throw it in the event log and SCOM will pick it up. Because I wrote this thing I, wrote, I write tests because SCOM doesn't see them. Is SCOM then bad? No, it's not. But SCOM will tell me if a database backup fails. It won't tell me if I've never scheduled the thing, right? if it's not there and it should be. That's the problem I'm trying to solve. And if you have lots and lots and lots of tests, I have, I'm working, I just write the tests and run them at night. It's fine if it's thousands, no problem. Some looping in there, don't overdo it and have it run. And now during the day, I have something like this. I'm still playing with it. This is pseudocode, this is not real. But basically, it runs a simplified list of PESTA tests that fit in one screen. And the test itself is running a whole bunch of other PESTA tests and parsing the result, counting the number of errors. That's what I'm doing. So I'm basically adding a layer on top of a lot of tests. But the only reason that I am 
not confronted with what you just saw where my screen just goes on and on and on and I'm just sitting there. Uh, oh, there was an error, right? That's what I'm trying to avoid. I want to have a test that gives me one simple overview. Your production servers, your DR is fine, your backups are fine, your SAN is fine, your test servers are also fine. Oh, there's a problem in your uh, uh, dev environment. It needs to fit on one screen. I need to be able to come, home, uh, come to work in the morning, grab a coffee, fire up my laptop, see if anything failed during the night, and if maybe for sanity checks, I just need to hit a button and it just test it, it um, runs the checks for me, or even have it on a screen that looks at it in the background. I think having tests on a screen, like SCUM, you see these departments that have servers, uh, sorry, monitors hanging on the wall, where they look at errors, I don't think this is a good idea, personally. At some point, you're going to not see it anymore, right? Uh, it, you, and you need to be warned if it goes wrong, not have, have it in front of you all the time. So those are my two ways that I want to test them. Yes? Yeah, the end unit export? Yeah. Yes, that's um, uh, basically what I'm doing now. Uh, uh, just export everything to the end unit format and even have SCOM um, on the server where I test it. The end unit, I'll, I'll parse the end unit and then throw errors in the event log so SCOM can pick them up so the operations team can see that. Right? Uh, that's basically where I'm going now, instead of having everything roll through your screen. Um, OMS, same thing. Uh, also a cool way to do some reporting. Usually uh, other departments will have some monitoring thing, right? Uh, like I said, we use this to warn the operating team if something is missing. Not if something breaks, they have something for that already probably, right? If, you're, if your backup fails, they'll see it. That's okay. But if the backup's not there, that's when you're in trouble. I have five minutes left, so I'll spend one of those five minutes for a sh with a shameless plug that I did before as well. Um, <laughs> I'm the organizer of a SQL Saturday in the Netherlands. Uh, September 30 is free-ish, a 15 euro lunch fee that we charge. Every session is in English. I think we're going to have six tracks. It's a SQL Server day. There will be PowerShell. Um, we've got like 450 people showing up. So if you're in the neighborhood, it's in the middle of the country. It's a small country. It doesn't matter where it is. <laughs> <laughs> I, I get so many speakers from oh yeah, um, uh, we have a user group session in Amsterdam well technically it's not Amsterdam but fine <laughs> um, I even had one that came over from America and he called me I need your help because I cannot find a decent flight from Amsterdam to Brussels Amsterdam to Brussels dude I'll bring you <laughs> 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 You laugh, who said on the bike? You, okay, you laugh about this, but we, he has um, a barbecue combined with um, a SQL server. No, that's a good idea, actually. No, uh, there's something called SQL Grillen. In, in German, this is a Bratwurst and Beer and a bunch of SQL server sessions in Lingen uh, in the summer. And there's one speaker coming over from California. No, not California. Where is Joey? America. Um, <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> But he lands in Amsterdam, and he's going to cycle all the way, uh, stop at my house halfway, uh, and then cycle the next day onwards to Lingen. So he's going to cycle from Amsterdam to a place in Germany uh, because he likes to do that. So it does happen. Anyhow, um, I think we're out of time, right? How are we doing? Th two, three minutes. Uh, you guys have any questions? I'll be here the rest of the day. Um, if, um, if you want to chat about things, find me. Um, and for the rest, that's it for me. I hope you have a great day, and uh, tomorrow as well. Still one more day to go. Thank you. Thank you.